തുണി കഴിഞ്ഞ്
Sir, is it audible? Sir, sir? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Dr. Amal has joined? Yeah, yeah. I've seen he's there on because I once sounded, but I think no response was there from his side. Amal? I'm, I'm here. Amal oh, okay, here. he's there. He's there. He's there. Yeah, I think we can. Uh, can we start, uh, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. A very good morning to everyone who have joined this online talk from far and wide. And welcome all to this talk titled The Space Science in Universities by Dr. Amal Chandran. Today is July 27th, the day Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, in whose name? In who, whose name? The university is renamed after in honor of his remarkable scientific legacy. Breath is last doing what he loved the most. Talking to the young minds, igniting their passion and giving fire to their dreams. You have to dream before your dreams can come true. This is one of my favorite quotes of Dr. APJ. Eight years have passed since this great visionary has left this earthly abode. And here we are revisiting his legacy and scientific temperament. Joining us today is Dr. Dr. Amal Chandran. Dr. Amal is currently the head of the small satellite division at the laboratory of course, atmospheric and space physics at the University of Colorado. He's also the program manager of NASA's Apex, Dialoglow, Sunset, 
and Mandus CubeSats. Together, they comprise the first generation test bed for space weather innovation through small satellites. He has also served as the program manager for the INSPIRE program, an international consortium of universities building space science satellites. Previously, he served as the assistant professor at the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering at Nanyang Technological University. He was the director for space technology at the Sat Satellite Research Center at NTU, where he led the development of four satellite missions and a space application center for training space scientists and engineers. As a matter of pride, Dr. APJ, Dr. Amal uh, did his BTEC in industrial engineering from CET. I believe I should defer some information to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Saji Gobinath, who is joining me to greet the distinguished gathering. Over to you, sir. Good morning, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Amal, uh, my colleagues uh, uh, from the university and uh, the participants attending from uh, different parts of uh, the, the state and the country. Uh, uh, at the outset, uh, uh, let me join all of you to pay homage to the uh, arguably the most popular uh, president, the most people's president of the country, uh, Sri uh, Dr. Abdul Kalam. Uh, we all know that uh, the type of inspiration he has made in each of us, uh, to the type, the type of scientific temper he has brought in each of us, and uh, to create a, a spirit of achievement and spirit of dreaming for higher heights. These are all being uh, uh, remembered as a great legacy of him. Uh, we know that uh, one area which India is extremely proud of is, is its uh, strides in the space sciences. Uh, we are today the world's uh, lowest cost uh, space expedition uh, capabilities. Uh, most of them are indigenously developed. And uh, we should be, each of us, uh, proud that uh, Kerala has actually contributed uh, substantially to uh, into this movement. In fact, uh, I remember that uh, a few years back, as a part of setting up a space park in uh, Kerala, we did a, a roadshow in uh, the one of the world's largest uh, aerospace uh, events in the world at Toulouse, uh, where some of you may be knowing that where Airbus is uh, located. And uh, we did not have to say, tell anybody about Kerala because they all know about Kerala. They all know about Rwanda because they know that the, the space research in the world is actually a sort of a capital of space research in the world as such. And that is actually the, uh, the, the, the reason why we actually thought that this time when we are uh, uh, paying homage to uh, uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kala, uh, on whose name our university is uh, uh, known, uh, we will actually bring a person uh, par excellence who actually shows his uh, mettle both in academia and in uh, in entrepreneurship. Because some of you know that uh, if you look at the space science and the space technologies, it actually shows across the world an exponential growth. The number of satellites which has gone uh, till let's say 2018 and the number of satellites which has gone to the space after 2018 if you take the number, you can see that the, every year it is sort of doubling. So it's maybe we don't have a Moore's law for space, but I think if something like that is there, I'm sure that uh, that is very clearly applicable even in the space science. So it is, it's actually moving away from only the national governments and the state research agencies, which are actually uh, putting uh, uh, research on that. Uh, it is actually moving also to private entrepreneurs who, the people who have got the right skills to do that. All of us know about the SpaceX missions. We also, maybe some of you may be knowing that uh, a company in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, out of IIT Madras, which uh, incidentally Kerala government has also funded as part of the, uh, the, the Space Park Initiative, is actually now grown almost to be a unicorn. Uh, uh, and they set up the, India's first private uh, uh, space launching station. So there is a substantive amount of uh, uh, change happening in the private uh, space. The startups, the youngsters are actually coming out with solutions for the space. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, I have been told that many of the space missions today has got products developed by the small startups uh, and uh, going into the uh, into the space person. So in this context, we thought that uh, uh, the APJ Abdul Kalam University, if it has to leave to the true name of uh, the, uh, the leader whose name we are, it is high time that we should actually create that spirit of uh, uh, innovation among all the youngsters, uh, uh, young students 
to create uh, a, a space ecosystem in the state. So the first name which came to my mind because I was associated with uh, Amal, uh, uh, Professor Amal, Dr. Amal for a very long time. In fact, uh, when uh, he was a student at CET, uh, we had the opportunity to work together on an interesting project. And then uh, uh, I, I was looking with all the type of things he's doing, uh, both at uh, uh, NTU as well as in University of Colorado. Today, he actually heads uh, NASA's uh, small science uh, satellite uh, uh, project. And not only that, he has also started a company in Toronto, uh, uh, a, a startup company. In fact, uh, uh, we could uh, convince him that Toronto is the place to come because he had a lot of options, but he could actually start the company in uh, Technopark, which is actually making uh, small satellites. And uh, in fact, uh, Professor Amal will speak about that in more detail. Many of the satellites are already being launched from different uh, space missions from different parts of the world. So a person who has created uh, how we can translate a knowledge into action, how do we actually look at the, the next stage of development of the space technologies and space ecosystem? He is actually giving us uh, the APJ Abdul Kalam Technological University, uh, APJ Abdul Kalam Memorial Lecture of the uh, of the university and uh, uh, i am extremely happy to welcome uh, professor amal in fact uh, the pr has already given his background so i'm not going to uh, do that but i'm sure that this is going to be a very truly inspirational uh, talk because this is not uh, coming only from a professor it is not coming only from a researcher but it's coming from a professor researcher and a person who has actually translated that into the action and i think that is the way we should uh, go ahead. I'm sure that all of you will have a lot of questions to interact with Professor Amal. Uh, he comes once in a while to, to random to look at his company and we will hopefully we'll have opportunity to have him uh, in a face-to-face -face discussion also in the days to come. So without taking much time, uh, I, let me hand over to uh, uh, Dr. Amal uh, on the, the uh, APG Abdul Kalam uh, Memorial Lecture, uh, uh, Space Science in Universities. Over to you, uh, Professor Thank you very much, sir. Um, I hope I'm audible. Um, yes. So, uh, well, thank you very much. First of all, it's an honor and a privilege to be here. So thank you very much for inviting me to give a memorial lecture in uh, named after a, such a very inspirational person. I can honestly say that he was one of the inspirations for me to pursue uh, space science once I graduated from CET and uh, moved to the US for my master's. Uh, Dr. Saji Gobinad is, of course, a, a, a mentor for me. Um, I had the honor and privilege of working with him during my undergraduate project. And, uh, you know, he, he wrote a recommendation letter when I was applying for grad school. So, <laughs> so it's, I think it's a full circle to be able to collaborate with you now. Um, so let me, let me get started. So uh, first of all, I want to say that um, I'm a very hands-on person. And uh, one of the things that I found when I moved from from CET from my undergraduate education in Kerala and came to the US for my master's was the difference in engineering was you know it, it was it was a sea change you know the way that we were teaching engineering in um, in Kerala at that time um, and how it was being taught in in US universities was very different you had the opportunity of actually getting your hands on hardware and working with the hardware um, so I was doing industrial engineering. It was, um, you know, for half the semester, for half of your course, you're with mechanical. And I really like the mechanical side of things. So when I came to the US, I started doing aerospace and my you know, career completely took off on a different trajectory. So uh, with that introduction, let me get started and I will share my screen. Um, Um, can you please enable screen sharing for me? We'll do that. We'll do that. Okay. Yes, okay. it's done. It's done. Yes. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I hope you're able to see my slides. Yes, sir. 
Okay. Um, so my name is Amal Chandran. I was, um, I was, uh, and I think, you know, you see a lot of satellites here. I will talk about this um, in, a, in, in a bit. Um, so these are the Inspire series of satellites. I started putting this program together in 2017. We have now four satellites in orbit. The fifth one is going to be launched in a couple of days. Um, so the total of seven satellites, two of them are in build, and hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll be having the fifth one launched successfully in a couple of days. So I'll speak about this, but um, I, I, you know, I always show this slide um, of my journey. Um, so I was born and I grew up in Trivandrum, and as Dr. Saji um, Gobinath mentioned, it's one of it's a great place to be if you are interested in space. Um, so I I was at CET, and you know I, I had a lot of spare time in CET. So we would get out of college, we would go to the beach nearby, we would be playing cricket or something over there. Um, and I used to see the rocket launch, the um, the sounding rocket launch from uh, from Tumba. So if you ever get a chance, I believe the sounding rocket launch is on Wednesday. So if you get a chance, please go and see it. It's um, it's one of the uh, unique opportunities that you get um, while you are in Trivandrum. Not a lot of people have seen it. Um, so you know, I was I was fortunate enough to see it, and it really inspired me to uh, to be able to pursue space science um, or rocket science, as they call it. Um, so after I finished my undergraduate degree, I moved to the U.S. for my master's. I did a master of science at Virginia Tech. Um, I did a Ph.D. and a master's at the University of Col in, in Colorado. And uh, there I focused on um, aerospace engineering with a focus on satellite uh, design and instrumentation. After that, I worked at the University of Alaska. Uh, there was a LIDAR station, so we would shoot uh, LIDARs into the night sky looking at the upper atmosphere. So LIDAR is a laser and you can flash it up and you can look at interesting species from the reflections that um, that come, come back. Um, Alaska was about, it was in Fairbanks, so this was just south of the Arctic Circle. So uh, it's beautiful. And we were studying Aurora. So, you know, sometimes we would have sounding rockets that would take instruments and look at the upper atmosphere as well. Uh, it was beautiful, but it was very cold. For somebody from the tropics, from Trivandrum, it was really cold. So I moved back to Colorado. That's not a very warm place either. Uh, but I moved back to Colorado in 2014, and I've been here. And in between, I uh, went to Singapore. I was the director of the Satellite Research Center and an assistant professor there for five years. Um, and I built four satellites, two of which are going up on July 30th. Um, so I moved back uh, in 23, in 22, um, and then I've been the small sat group lead at the University of Colorado. Um, so, you know, we talk about India being uh, one of the primary uh, space research groups, um, I mean, space research countries in the world, and that is absolutely true. Uh, but one unfortunate thing that has happened in India, this is, you know, not a criticism or anything, but but a mere fact when you look at how space science in the U.S. has grown, um, is that most of the space science, the satellite building, the instrument building, all happens at the Indian Space Research Organization, and they do a great job of it. Um, the Indian Space Research Organization is mostly an engineering-led organization. Um, and, you know, VSSC being one of the primary centers, the rocket people have a lot of say in how the, the, the organization is run. Uh, in the U.S., however, um, what has happened from a very early time was that Whenever NASA would have a mission, they would have a call out for what they want to do, how the spacecraft should be built, and what kind of instruments that they would want put in it. So universities would actually propose instruments and sometimes even spacecrafts. And NASA used to work like, and they still do, uh, they work as a contract, as a program office. And they award out contracts where these instruments and spacecrafts get built. So the University of Colorado is one of the universities that has a full-fledged space lab, um, and its annual revenues are about $100 million, and they have full every facility for building out uh, spacecrafts and, um, and, um, and instruments. Uh, so what happened in that way was that a lot of space instrumentation capability got built up in universities. So India has, you know, India is slowly starting to do that. They're opening it up now, and there are much more opportunities for doing this kind of thing in universities. Um, so a bit of a background. So when I came to the University of Colorado, a lot of, you know, the way that your career shapes up is because you are in the right place at the right time and you make use of your opportunities. So I came to Colorado in 2005, 
And in 2007, this spacecraft that you see launched, and it was it was uh, called Aeronomy of Ice in the Mesosphere or AIM. Um, and uh, and and this was a satellite that were looking at clouds in the mesosphere. So the mesosphere is a region of the atmosphere that is between 80 to 90 kilometers. And you get tiny clouds. You get very thin layer of clouds that form there. These are the highest clouds that form in our atmosphere. Uh, these, you know, most of the weather that we see is about 15 to 20 kilometers. Above that is the stratosphere. So the troposphere is where most of the weather is. Then you have the stratosphere and the mesosphere is above the stratosphere. Um, but you get very thin clouds that form in the polar uh, regions in summer, summertime, not the winter time, the summertime, because the summer mesosphere is ironically colder than the winter mesosphere. The picture you see in the bottom uh, left, um, or, or sorry, the bottom right, is actually um, uh, clouds that, uh, the, this is a picture from the International Space Station. Uh, most of the weather that you see is um, is in is in that region where you see the the uh, the, the orange haze, and then you see this tiny uh, a thin strip of clouds way at the top, and those are the 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 the, uh, the ice clouds or the mesospheric clouds that that form. So this satellite was looking at those. It was an ultraviolet imager, and we would image these clouds, and we would understand why they form and whether they were indicators of climate change. I was a PhD student uh, that helped to build the instrument, and uh, I was analyzing data from this um, from the spacecraft. Now, if you look at the spacecraft, it's a fairly big spacecraft. Um, so this spacecraft was about 300 kilograms in mass. Uh, you know, so it's it's what we call a traditional spacecraft that is big and you know built in the classical way. Everybody is wearing these bunny suits, you know, so everything is kept clean. Uh, but at the same time that this was happening. I was part of a project called the Stu Colorado Student Space Weather Experiment. This was what we call a CubeSat. Um, and this was the first CubeSat that actually returned science data from orbit. Um, so I graduated in 2010. And what we have here is you know, the semester on the top. Um, and it goes from 2008 uh, to 2014. And the number of students that enrolled in this project um, um, during, each, uh, during each semester. So this was not funded by NASA, because at that time, NASA did not think that we could get uh, science done from these tiny student-led uh, projects called CubeSat. So this was a satellite that was about the size of a shoebox, uh, smaller than a shoebox. So uh, the dimensions were 30 by 10 by 10 centimeters, so roughly about this size. Um, and it was funded by the National Science Foundation, and it had a particle detector that was looking at charged particles coming into the Earth's atmosphere through the magnetic field lines. So this is the same process why you would see an aurora, where you know charged particles from the sun come, hits the magnetic field, goes along the field to the poles, and you know energizes uh, nitric oxide and other atmospheric, um, um, and causes these atmospheric emissions, and you see the auroras. But when they come in, the satellite would carry a particle detector and would see the particle densities. So it was a very simple uh, satellite, um, and NSF funded it, and um, we did proposal. You know, we we submitted a proposal. The proposal got funded. Then we actually. Uh, did a trade study of different components that we could use to build the satellite, built it, launched it in 2012. So by that time I had left, but I was in I was involved in the initial design. Then I graduated, uh, but the satellite went up and then we had data from about, till about 2014. And um, it, it was a game changer in the way that it operated. It operated for more than two years. Uh, we got a lot of science data, and it has so far generated upwards of 25 plus peer-reviewed publications, including a nature paper. Um, so actually two nature papers. So that's that was a big deal for a CubeSat to be able to do um, you know, that kind of science. And it kind of showed that you can have a disruptive model um, where CubeSats or you know, satellites that were non-traditional, like we were get, taking commercial off-the-shelf electronics, so we were getting processors that you would put on cube on cell phones, for example, and flying them and actually getting really good data. Uh, and we had a number of students that were trained on it, including myself. So a lot of students, um, you know, got hands-on training and 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 experience building a satellite, launching it into orbit, and actually getting data back.
Um, so again, you know, being at the right time at the right, uh, right place at the right time and making use of your opportunities was uh, was critical in this. So this was apart from my PhD project, something that I did and that I really translated in, in a, during the rest of my career. Uh, so if you guys have any questions, you know, if you if you you please feel free to put it in chat and then, you know, we can get into it after after the presentation. So I talked about what what was a small satellite. Uh, so when you look at and I think, um, you know, Dr. Saji mentioned this in the um, in, in the introduction of how the industry is changing and how in the last few years, a large number of satellites are have been um, have been um, have been launched. So I have a few slides to actually illustrate that. Um, and I hope that, you know, we can have a discussion on it. I'm keen to hear your thoughts on this as well. Um, so what is a small satellite? So when you say small satellite, it means different things to different people. So a couple of slides ago, I mm -hmm. showed this slide. This is a small satellite. So this uh, aim is under what NASA calls the small explorer series. So, you know, this was classified as a small satellite. Now, then, when you say small satellite, That's people's right. perception That's of this right. is entirely different. Um, so according to this one, a small satellite is between 600 to 1,200 kgs. That's really heavy. That's one ton, okay? So nobody calls those small satellites anymore. So nowadays, what we call a small satellites are between about one kilograms to 200 kilograms, okay? And usually CubeSats are nanosatellites that are between one to about 30 kgs, okay? So here it says one to 10, but you know, we, we now CubeSats are growing in scale and going to about 30 kg. So, I mean, I, I will talk about what a CubeSat is, um, but generally a CubeSat is, uh, is something that we say is inside a, uh, when, when you launch it is inside a canister and there is a pusher plate and a spring that will, if it, and, and this canister has a door that opens and the, the spring loaded uh, pusher plate pushes it out. Whereas a microSat usually has a ring that, uh, that is on top of the satellite and is interfacing with the launch vehicle and the ring deploys the satellite. So there's many different ways of classifying it. Uh, but now, you know, we look at satellites below maybe 300 kgs and call all of them as small satellites. And why is why is everybody talking about this? And uh, one of the reasons is, is this figure that you see here. Uh, so this is small satellites launched by the numbers. So if you take 10 years ago, you know, just, just a decade ago, the number of small satellites launched was about in 2012 was about about 40 or um, or 30 to 40. Okay, and it was almost all educational, government, and military. There was very few commercial satellites being launched. And now, when you see in 2021, there were about 1,700 satellites launched. So. I mean, that's a, almost a, um, you know, what is it? Um, 500 times uh, growth in just just in, in, in nine years. And most of it is in the commercial sector, okay? So a lot of it is contributed by these constellations that are providing internet from space. So Starlink that essentially is a SpaceX company that wants to provide internet from low earth orbit and one web that India recently launched the last set of satellites, the last two launches forever from India. Uh, so OneWeb and, um, and Starlink contribute quite a bit of these satellites that are being launched, but you can see this growth uh, in the last nine years of the small satellite segment. So it's, it's growing really fast. Um, it used to be that in, in a career, if you build five satellites, uh, that's a very wonderful career. You know, if you are in academia, if you are in space science and you're doing research and you in your career, you've been involved in five satellite builds throughout. your. That's a wonderful career. I built I have launched seven satellites in the last four years. So, you know, so uh, so that paradigm is changing very, very rapidly. Um, and when you go by the numbers, the U.S. contributes majority of these satellites. India is not far behind. I mean, you know, in terms of total numbers, it's very far behind. It, this is not just launching. This is where the country that registers the satellite. So all of Starlink, OneWeb are, you know, getting into like UK um, is uh, OneWeb 
satellites are registered under the UK government and Starlink is under the US operator. So it's not number of satellites launched, it's just where the satellite, which country is registering these satellites. Um, so, so again, um, so 70% of of most satellites launched are are from the US in the last um, nine years, and and India has about twenty one satellites. Um, China has two seventy four, and UK has a lot, which out of which you know three ninety four were one web satellites. But just just look at this number. Don't look at these big numbers. Look at um, look at this one. In the last nine years, fifty countries have launched their first satellites. So that is a significant change in the number of people that are now spacefaring nations. Um, and, and that is drastically increasing. This kind of uh, a growth has not been seen in the industry before. Uh, and now when you look at the, a comparison for this is how the car industry um, was, uh, was changing uh, almost a hundred years ago. So we call it the Model T. You know, the Ford Model T was the one that was uh, first produced in an assembly line and changed how um, you know horse-drawn carriages were replaced by the Model T in America, and that drove a lot of the industrial revolution and free, um, uh, you know, the the industry and welcomed in the industrial age in America. So um, a group comparison uh, with where the satellite industry is now is with the the automobile industry about a hundred years ago. Uh, so the production rate in 1910 for the Model T was about 19,000. Um, and then by 1920, in 10 years, it uh, went to almost a million uh, vehicles uh, per year. And you can see what happened to the price per unit. From $23,000 per car, it went to about just under $5,000. So with mass production, the cars became cheaper. And that's exactly what we are seeing with satellites. So Starlink um, has assembly lines for making these satellites. So the satellite industry was a very bespoke industry in the sense that every satellite was a very customized, unique piece of hardware. Now that is really changing where you're getting assembly lines and satellite production is increasing um, you know, by, by huge numbers um, every year to, to meet the current demand that is there. And, and the same with launch vehicles. To get all these satellites up in orbit, you have many launch companies that are coming up across the world. And as Sajisar mentioned, there are a couple of launch companies in India, private launch companies, Skyroot and Agnipur, um, that are close to getting their first um, you know, launch vehicles achieve orbit as well. So it's an industry-wide phenomenon. It's a global phenomenon. There are many private players coming up. Again, SpaceX led the way. Uh, in the U.S. now, there are about four other launch companies. There is Rocket Labs that is um, a major player as well. Uh, they launch out of New Zealand, so it's an American and New Zealand company. Um, then there is Firefly, uh, Phantom Space. There's many launch companies in the U.S. Uh, the same with, you know, China has a lot of companies. India has two uh, launch companies coming up. Australia has Gilmore Space. There's a lot of launch companies coming up as well. So it's an exciting period in the industry right now. Um, and, uh, you know, we can discuss the fun stuff. So CubeSats is what I do. I, you know, I have, I do work with slightly bigger satellites. So the bigger satellite that I have been personally involved as a principal investigator is a 30 kilogram satellite. So it's, you know, nothing in the class of a 200 kg, but these are small satellites. These are fun stuff. Um, so I thought, you know, what I will do in this, um, this talk is just give an idea of some of the small satellites that we build um, in in uh, through the university programs and kind of give you a flavor of what we do, how we structure it, how we teach students, and you know, and maybe something that we can do in uh, in Kerala as well. Um, so uh, the CubeSat standard was discovered, or like the concept definition happened at the um, the uh, the start of the century. So in terms of you know concept maturation this is only 20 years old so it's very recent the first satellites were launched about um, you know 20 years ago in these specifications so basically a cube a sa this satellite is a cube that was 10 centimeter by 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters so 10 centimeters in length width and height so it was 10 centimeter cube one but these were stackable so if you take a cube and stack two other cubes on top you have a 3u so that's 30 centimeters in one dimension and still 10 by 10 in the other. Now you stack two 30 centimeters side by side, and then you have, you know, you have a height of 30 centimeters, a width of 20, and uh, a, uh, you know, a, 
sorry, a width of 10 centimeters and a length of 20. So it's 30 by 20 by 10. So you have a six U. Uh, so you can stack each of these in different configurations. So the standard sizes are one U. You stack two one U's on top of each other, you have a two U. You stack three three one U's, then you have a three U. Stack two three U's together, you have a six U. So you can have multiple of different sizes, but the boards, you know, the every satellite has uh, a few subsystems that are common to it. So it has an onboard. So think of a satellite as a cell phone, right? Your cell phone has a processor. So just like that, a satellite has a processor. It has a power system. So just like your cell phone, which is a battery pack and a means to charge the battery pack. Uh, so the means to charge it in space is solar cells, solar arrays. So you have solar panels that help you charge your battery pack. And this battery pack and your power system handles all the power to the instruments and the computer and everything. Uh, then basically a cell phone is a transmitter, right? And the receiver. So the satellite also has a transmitter and a receiver. So you have a radio. Uh, so you have a computer, you have a processor, you have a power system, you have a receiver. So these three things are very important. Another very important thing is something that helps you point your satellite. The satellite that you see here, there is an aperture at the bottom that is a camera. So if you have a camera, you want to you know, possibly take a look at the earth, or maybe you want to take a look at the sun, you want to image the sun, but whatever you want to image, you want to be able to point your satellites so that you are looking at the right thing. So the satellite needs to have something called a pointing system. So we call it an attitude control and an attitude determination system. The satellite also needs to find out where it is. So you can use the stars, you can use the sun for reference, and then you can orient your satellite to point your um, you know, your sensor at your target and take a picture. So you have a pointing system and then you have a structure system, you know, you need thermal control. So, so basically it's, I mean, I tell the students, so uh, when I run CubeSat programs in the university, some of the students are mechanical because we need to design a mechanical structure. Some of the students are double E's because we need to design the power system. Some of them are, you know, um, computer science students because everything needs software. Right, so building a satellite is a very interdisciplinary process, okay? Um, and, and you need scientists because a lot of them carry um, instruments and the physicist or the scientists determine on, you know, the optical design and how you, uh, in, how you design your instruments. So a CubeSat, a satellite is only a vehicle. The instrument is the passenger. That's what you're building it for, okay? Um, so again, uh, just to give you guys an idea, the concept definition was in 99. The first flight with CubeSats happened in 2003. And then uh, by 2018, we had the first interplanetary CubeSats that were flown by NASA. It piggybacked along a, a larger Mars mission. And uh, you know, one of the things you do when you have an interplanetary um, mission, and we will see that with Chandrayaan-3 very shortly, is that eventually, or, you know, or very soon, you need to leave the gravity well of the, the Earth and then go to the other planet. So in this case, it was Mars, and you have to do an orbit insertion around Mars so that you can orbit Mars. So this orbit insertion was happening on the far side of Mars where Earth was not visible. You couldn't see it. So these CubeSats that went were actually in communication with the satellite and acted as a relay and gave information on how this orbit insertion was going. So, and then they flew off. So, you know, these were two small CubeSats that did this relay during uh, orbital insertion and uh, helped with that. So those were called Marco and, you know, really incredible mission um, in that. Um, so these are some of the leading universities in, um, in CubeSats. Uh, so we don't have an Indian university in there yet. Um, we should probably change that. And I hope it will change in the, uh, in the coming decades and decades or so. Kyushu Institute of Technology has the most number of satellites. Uh, university of Colorado, I've been associated with these two universities. So University of Colorado and Nanyang Technological University in Singapore uh, both have very active space programs. They both have full satellite um, uh, labs that can uh, design, build, uh, operate satellites um, um, once they go up. So what we call full-fledged um, um, you know, space labs. Uh, and the Inspire program that we have has QTech as a partner as well. So these are some of the leading um, you know, universities that are part of this Inspire consortium as well. Uh, so... 
and 200 plus academic operators have launched satellites between um, you know just these nine years. So I, I'm 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 hopeful that we will so very soon start seeing Indian universities in this list. Uh, I already talked to to this slide of you know how the the cubesats were uh, built. Um, again, you know I encourage you to take a look at this number of students. So the number of students was fairly you know summer semester usually you don't have students uh, working on it, uh, but we had about ten students in the first couple of semesters where the proposal was defined. Uh, the first proposal was not funded. Um, so when the proposal is not funded in American universities, what usually happens is students want to work on live projects. So when the first proposal did not get funded, we had a drastic drop. Um, and then we got uh, NSF to fund it. And then immediately the numbers went up uh, quite, quite significantly. And we had uh, on average about 20 students per semester taking the, this was a project score. So the students actually ended up building the hardware, testing it, putting it all together and then operating it. Um, so that's the model that I've tried to adopt. Um, so we we've refined it quite a bit and um, and tried to adopt it in um, in the universities that I have been since then. Um, and now when you look at NASA and what NASA is doing with small satellites, it's very very impressive. Uh, so this is a, um, a a graphic of the NASA CubeSat small sat fleet. Uh, so this is the past, current, and future um, missions that they have listed here. Um, and, and what is happening here is, you know, you have a number of spacecraft that are Earth observing, a number that is solar physics looking at the sun. You have some that is doing astrophysics, so looking at galaxies and, um, and other stars for exoplanets, which are planets revolving around other stars. You have the Marco spacecraft that I mentioned, where the first interplanetary that went to Mars, and then the Mars helicopter that was on the uh, the last Mars mission that is now doing, uh, you know, winged flight, which is the first winged flight on any other planet. They also classify that as a small satellite. The reason they qualify that as a small satellite is that uh, is the design philosophy again. So you're using commercial off-the-shelf parts, um, you know, this is not the space grade parts that you usually uh, put in regular spacecraft, but so you're willing to take more risk, um, uh, you know, with these small spacecraft. Um, and then, um, you know, a couple of uh, spacecraft that will go to, uh, to beyond uh, Jupiter orbit to Saturn. Um, so, again, you know, some of these I'll talk about. I'm not going to talk a lot about each of these because some of these are missions that I have no idea what, uh, what it is, but... Um, at the University of Colorado, this is the CU Boulder uh, CubeSat fleet. And as you can see, it's a very significant number of satellites that, uh, that we actually uh, build and operate. Uh, some of these satellites have already flown. Uh, I talked about the Colorado Student Space Weather Experiment, so CSSWE. That was the first satellite that we flew and was a phenomenal success. Um, InspireSat-1, that was um, a partnership between CU Boulder and IAST in India primarily, and this was the reason that I kept coming to India over the last uh, five, six years, and it was a very wonderful collaboration. Um, that one also is a solar um, uh, mission, so we have an X-ray spectrometer that flew on the MINGS, MINGS-2 missions. It's a NASA-funded spectrometer. The launch was by ISRO. Uh, so it was a truly, um, you know, U.S.-India collaboration with Taiwan also providing an instrument. Uh, so very international um, effort. The spacecraft has been operational now for about 16 months um, and getting really good science data. I'll show some of the plots very soon. Um, and I am currently program manager on the Apex satellite. That's a 6U satellite um, and Sunset and uh, Dynaglow. So Sunset is a solar mission. Uh, looking at uh, what we call as coronal mass ejection. So these are flares that come out of the sun and there's charged particles that come with it. Uh, so we are looking at that because it's very important because when these flares come and hit the earth, it can change the uh, the density of the upper atmosphere, which can increase drag. And then that can be, that can have quite a big effect on satellite orbits, for example. It can also cause uh, ionospheric density anomalies, which can affect uh, GPS signals and cause scintillation and things. So, um, so space weather is very important, and Sunset is a, a spacecraft that's looking at space weather. Uh, Dynaglow is two satellites. It's looking at waves propagating in the atmosphere. Um, so we look at uh, what we call as gravity waves. These are not gravitational waves. Gravity waves are waves where 
the restoring force is gravity. So this is like ripples in a pond. If you throw a, um, a stone in a pond and you see the ripples, uh, it's the same process. So anytime there is a disturbance in a fluid, so the atmosphere is a fluid, there are waves that propagate from it. And this is an important wave by which, you know, energy gets transferred between one layer of the atmosphere to the other. Uh, so Dynaglo looks at these gravity waves. Um, another satellite that we have launched and is, in, is operational right now is called CUTE. Uh, it's a cute satellite. Um, the name stands for Colorado Ultraviolet Transit Explorer. This is another thing in the uh, industry. We have great acronyms. <laughs> so you find, uh, you know, any every successful mission needs an acronym first. Uh, so INSPIRE is also an acronym. That stands for International Satellite Program in Research and Education. Uh, SUNSET is... Uh, Solar Coronal Ejection Tracker. So yeah, <laughs> we need we need acronyms. So um, CUTE or Colorado Ultraviolet Transit Explorer is actually uh, looking at an ultraviolet star. So just like our star's primary energy is in the visible, there are stars whose primary energy is in the ultraviolet. So this is looking at an ultraviolet star. And as a planet goes in front of it, the star's brightness dims. And because a planet's orbit is periodic, you will see the dimming at periodic intervals. And that is how you can determine that it is actually a planet that is passing in front of the star. And then from that, you can determine the size of the planet and um, its orbit, the distance from the, the star, et cetera. So it's, it's discovering exoplanets around ultraviolet stars. So, um, and it's, it's the size of a shoebox. So, you know, a lot of interesting science is being done by these very small platforms. Uh, in the Inspire series, we have, I think I have that slide up next. Um, so these are the Inspire series of satellites, and these are the universities that are part of the Inspire consortium. So the University of Colorado Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, where I work, is the primary university in it. Um, I would say just as important, uh, one of the founding members, the other founding member is IAST, the Indian Institute of Science and Technology uh, at Valiamala. Then National Central University in Taiwan, um, NTU Singapore, uh, University of Versailles from France, uh, University of Alberta from Canada, Iowa, uh, Julich in Germany, uh, Sultan Qaboos University in Oman, Tel Aviv, and um, La Cien, which is the lab in uh, QTech. Um, so a lot of them have space programs. Um, universities like Sultan Qaboos are just starting to think of a program. They don't have um, much in development at all. Uh, so there was a faculty member that was starting to put together just you know lectures and slides from people like us um, and, and getting students interested. Um, InspireSat1 was the one that we launched last year and has been really successful. Um, and the primary partners were uh, the American University, Indian University in Taiwan. So all the countries are, uh, you know, the flags are there and you can see uh, the different countries that are involved in each of it. InspireSat4 is also called Arcade Atmospheric Coupling and Dynamics Explorer, and it is looking and it is going up on July 30th uh, from the PSLV. Um, it's a PSLV launch out of ISRO, so we are, you know, very very eagerly waiting for that. Um, the motivations for putting this together was: can we have an academic program for teaching spacecraft design? Um, you know, some universities do it really well, like Colorado, which has been doing it for a while, but a lot of people don't. So the idea was, what are the lessons learned? How can we translate this so that a newcomer can, uh, can you know, develop a curriculum for doing spacecraft design? Um, and can we use this as a means for what we call as capacity building? Because this is very niche technology. You know, this is um, your, your building for the future. So um, what, by by what I mean by capacity building is you don't want to just build one satellite and then be done because your students are going to graduate, you know, even while building a satellite, your students graduate. So you have to deal with when you build satellite within a university system, you have to deal with student turnover. So that knowledge is retained by the faculty or like graduate students or PhD students, but how do you make it sustainable, right? you've gone through the excitement of the, or the engineering exercise of building a satellite. What makes it sustainable is science results. So can you have an instrumentation program in parallel with the engineering effort of building a satellite? Can you get science returns? Because that's what's gonna make people publish and keep that interest and grow the program. 
Um, so, so that was one of the questions that, you know, how it's not just building one satellite, but developing sustainable programs. Um, and then, you know, the international collaboration aspect was there to see if, and, and the, because this is a very restricted field. Americans don't like to share technology with other countries. Other countries don't want to share launch or things, you know. So how can we foster something like this with uh, international collaboration? That was a very difficult piece to achieve as well. Um, um, I have a couple of satellites to show here. So InspireSat1 is this uh, this satellite. It's um, it's slightly bigger than a shoebox, I would say. It was about 12U, 10 kilograms. It had two instruments. Uh, one was NASA funded. Uh, the dual aperture X-ray spectrometer was NASA funded. Basically, you're looking at the sun in X-ray. Um, and every time there is a solar flare, um, the, um, the emissions of different energy bands go up. And these energy bands correspond to like elemental abundances. For example, the concentration of iron in the solar corona can go up, uh, silicon. So different things go up and the solar physicists try to understand why that happens. So we are understanding more about the sun. Um, and when the energy goes up, we know that in the Earth's atmosphere, there are certain regions where this energy is absorbed. So it helps to understand the energy budget of the Earth as well. Um, so you know, there's a lot of science that happens. And the compact ionosphere probe that was contributed by Taiwan was an instrument to look at in-situ plasma, which we, um, we can use for looking at things like signal scintillation in GPS. Um, so InspireSat2 or IDSat was a Taiwan-led uh, led satellite. And you can see it's significantly smaller than this one because it only had one instrument, which was the compact ionosphere probe. It was about 5 kg. And that one launched earlier and worked for about three months. This one is still going on, and it's been working about 16 months so far and going strong. Um, some pictures, uh, pictures worth more than 1,000 words. So this was launched from a PSLV. And this is one of the cool things you get to do if you are in the industry. So I was at Char um, on July 17th and 18th. So I just came back to the US after that. Um, and uh, you get to go to Sri Harikota if or you know other places as well when you when other providers are launching a satellite and you get to integrate your satellite on the rocket. So what you see this picture is actually on top of the fairing that's all the way up there. So you get to go into the vehicle assembly building um, and they set up a temporary clean room on top of the rocket. So there is an elevator that takes you up to the 42nd floor um, and then you get to integrate the satellite on top of the rocket and then they close the shroud and, um, and, and then they roll out the rocket to the launch pad. So it's a very interesting experience. It's one of the perks of the job. Um, this is RISAT, which India is using. Uh, it's a, it's one of the, it's an imaging satellite. Um, and there was two satellites on this, uh, INS2TD, a technology demonstrator, small satellite, and InspireSat1. Um, so just three satellites on this launch. Uh, so um, this is on a very interesting orbit called a dawn dusk orbit. So essentially what happens is, you know, you have sun on one side, the other side is eclipse. And this side of the earth, there will be sunlit, it will be nighttime. And around this circle, so if your sun is over here and this is your eclipse site, this is the terminator or what we call dawn dusk. So the satellite writes this terminator. So the precession speed is the same as what the earth's rotation speed and tilt of the axis is so that it's always in this terminator. So one side, so the solar panel's always seeing the sun. We ba very barely see eclipse. It's a, it's a really nice orbit because with the solar instrument, we always want to look at the sun. So, uh, so we can study the flares as they happen. So it's a, it's a great orbit to be in um, for looking at the sun. Uh, so yeah, it was it was on board the PSLV C-52 mission. The spacecraft's working well uh, after 16 months. That's how big the spacecraft was. These were handles that we put for handling the spacecraft. This is the ring that mates with the uh, this adapter here. And this is the shroud. Uh, these are you know glass blankets, glass wool. It's called glass wool. Uh, blankets inside the shroud for damping out um, uh, you know sound. Basically, it can take about three to four dBs of uh, of noise. Um, to you know during launch, you get a lot of acoustic noise. So this helps with acoustics um, inside the inside the sparing. Uh, so this is one of the things, and this is some data from orbit. 
so here we are comparing um, uh, DAX's, uh, the X-ray spectrometer data with Chandrayaan data. So the Chandrayaan-2 mission that is orbiting the um, orbit, so Chandrayaan-2 had a lander which unfortunately crashed on the moon. It also had an orbiter that is still working fine. So the orbiter carried a very similar spectrometer, uh, but we improved on that spectrometer. And at the lower energy bands, we get a much better spectral resolution than the Chandrayaan uh, instrument. So we get, so this is our plot and we're getting very good, um, we're getting much better energy resolution at the lower bands. And then um, at the higher bands, it matches quite well. The Chandrayaan data is a little bit more noisy than ours. So um, again, the point here is that from a small platform, you can get uh, really good um, results. Uh, but basically the, what this is, this is photon counts on the Y axis and on the X axis, you have different energy bands. So as I said, uh, when a flare happens, the energy bands will show some peaks. For example, there is a peak here and this will correspond to some elemental abundance. So you can study what's happening in the solar corona uh, when a flare happens and why these peaks and things happen. So that's what the scientists look for. Um, this is another one where we compared it. The black plot is um, a ghost instrument that is a geostationary instrument that carries uh, similar, it's, a, it's actually an imager. So we have cross compared it with uh, different instruments to look at uh, how it, um, how it how it captures flare. So the black is actually the, the, the Inspire Sat1 data. The green is actually the GOES instrument. So you can see at a flare time, it captures it pretty well. The red is Chandrayaan, the XSM data. Um, how did we build it? We had students from all these universities. So we had students from uh, India, Taiwan, and US all working together, putting together the satellite. Uh, basically, they would all come together to, to put it together. And they came to Boulder in Colorado. Uh, during the summer, and and it was a it was a wonderful group, um, and and it was it was a lot of fun um, putting this together, um, and we had uh, the the students won a couple of competitions as well presenting the idea. Uh, it's very powerful when you have universities, you know, different uh, students from different universities coming together and pitching the idea of um, of the satellite. So we had a student. This this Will was the um, the the project manager from Colorado. Uh, Kaustub was a student from IAST and Duani was a student from Taiwan. So they all worked together. Uh, they presented in Rome, uh, won a contest. So it was a great chance for the students to travel and present their results. Um, and, and this was 17 and 18. But by the time uh, the satellite launched, all of them had graduated. So, you know, you, you need to be able to have uh, deal with student turnovers when you build satellites as well. Uh, we had annual workshops. The first one was in Taiwan. Uh, it was a very cultural, you know, it was a chance for people to see different countries and get uh, cultural experiences as well. Uh, this was the second one in Colorado. So uh, the students had a wonderful opportunity to meet different people and um, and, and colleagues and, and build stuff. So um, I'll quickly show another satellite. I like to, sh to cycle through satellites. So this is InspireSat4 that's launching in a couple of days. Uh, built at NTU in Singapore, funded by Singapore. The launch was also paid for by Singapore, um, and it's looking at atmospheric coupling and uh, ionospheric density. So we are looking at like why electron density changes in the upper atmosphere um, and how the waves propagate up. As I mentioned, the waves that propagate up and transfer energy, and if there are reasons why this four-peak structure happens because of wave propagation. So we have instruments looking at waves and the... Uh, and 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 the um, the plasma. We also have a thruster that actually brings the satellite uh, down. Um, uh, so it will, you know, hopefully we will not cause any debris. Uh, we can lower the satellite altitude, and we can also study the atmosphere at lower altitude. So that's um, that's that's part of the concept. That is the the concept of the satellite. So that's what the internals of the satellite looks like. It also has a camera for imaging the earth. This is a rather, rather large satellite. It's about 30 kgs and about you know, a 30 centimeter cube. Um, so a quarter meter cube, basically. Um, and I'm going to play a video. I'm going to turn the volume a little low here. Um, but this is basically two minutes of how do you build a satellite? How do you put together the satellite? So what you see is a plate being put in with uh, the onboard avionics. You'll see a lot of cables here. Uh, and we have to make sure that the cables are, oops, uh, sorry. Uh, 
I apologize for that. PowerPoint didn't like it. <laughs> Let me see if I can pull that one again. So you see the different plates going in and then we are assembling all the different instruments. That's an infrared imager going in. Radios, antennas. Oh. Okay. We'll give it one more try. I don't know why I'm having too much trouble playing that, but that was almost the end of the video. So now they've put the solar panels on. And you have a cube. Okay. Um, and then uh, finally, I'd like to talk about um, the student satellite series program that I've been running at NTU. Uh, so NTU has a satellite research center and it's the birthplace of uh, the Singapore space program. The first Singapore satellite was built there um, and they are on to their 10th, 11th, and 12th satellite. So Scoob 1 was flown last year. Um, and then, okay, these dates are out of place. This is going up this year. So 2023 is when these two satellites are going up. They're going up a couple of days from now on July 30th. And Scoop 2 is actually um, uh, going up with these two satellites as well. Uh, so NTU has, as I mentioned before, they have all the facilities for building the satellites, testing it, because testing the satellites is very important. Uh, it's different from commercial electronics because your components have to work in the vacuum of space. So you have to build for space and you have to test for space. So having vacuum chambers, uh, being able to survive the vibration loads that a rocket goes through as it goes up. Uh, so your structure has to be sound enough that it survives those loads and you have to test for it. So you put it on a vibration table and you shake it to make sure that it can survive it. Uh, then you put it in the vacuum chamber to uh, and and you do a thermal cycling. Um, you operate it in uh, in vacuum. So this is a vacuum chamber that you see on the um, on the second picture on the right, um, where it's in the chamber. You close the chamber. You pump down the pressure to achieve vacuum, and then you let it operate. Uh, and then you need the antennas and the tracking center for being able to uh, to to run the operations as well. Um, so because we were having all these satellites when I was a faculty member. Um, I wanted to have a student um, a student program. So the idea was that we would get students to come in and build the satellites. Uh, so the primary objective was, again, hands-on education through design, development, testing, and operations. As I mentioned, I'm a very hands-on guy. I want, um, I want the students to be able to not just listen to the theory, but be able to go to the lab and put something together, um, and then develop instrumentation capability and develop uh, satellite technologies as well. Um, so we built this satellite called Scoop One that launched last year, um, and it, 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 so it was a 3U. Um, we had a camera as well. Uh, we had a solar spectrometer that was looking at the sun in different channels. Why do we look at the sun? Because we want to understand the energy output of the sun, and especially how that energy output changes when a flare or something like that happens. Um, it was launched with from ISRO. We paid for the launch. Uh, it was a Singapore launch, and um, we paid for that. Um, and then we had a permanent magnet. So when you have a permanent magnet, what happens is that 
you know, just like a compass, right? A magnet will align itself with the north south of the Earth's magnetic field. So if you put a magnet in your satellite, it'll align itself uh, with the north south um, of the magnetic field and rotate about the third axis. So it's not active pointing, but you know you get good enough pointing where you know if you're looking at the sun, your uh, satellite's going to rotate, and the spectral sensors on whichever face it is in is going to see the sun. Um, so uh, how did I? How did we structure this? You know, like any project, you need a program manager, you need a systems engineer, and you need subsystem leads. You need an RF engineer that look at communications. You need a power systems engineer for looking at the uh, the power systems. Uh, an attitude determination control algorithm type person for looking at the the pointing, uh, a process, a, you know, a software and embedded systems guy for looking at your CDH. So I structured it with PhD students doing a lot of the project management and systems engineering. And then we had finally a project student. So uh, working on each of these subsystems. Uh, we had about a total of 53 students that were trained as part of this program and worked on different aspects of the spacecraft. Um, and, uh, yeah, we, you know, this was how the, the, the program went. We had COVID COVID was a big, uh, problem because I structured all these programs, then COVID hit and nobody could actually physically come to the lab. So all these programs suffered during COVID, um, somehow finished everything and then, uh, managed to launch it in June of 22. But, uh, you know, the different milestones all got a little delayed because of, uh, because of COVID. Um, yeah, you know, fabrication, things like critical design review, all of these things actually got a little bit, um, a little bit delayed. I'm, I'm, I'm familiar. I know I understand that some of these terms are unfamiliar to you, uh, but basically every satellite program has about four critical milestones. So the first one is um, a uh, what we call a preliminary. I mean, there is a system design review where we formalize the requirements. Then we have a preliminary design review a critical design review. And finally, once everything has been built and tested, we have a flight readiness review. So these are the four critical milestones that we try to hit and everything else um, you know, fits within these, uh, within these milestones. Um, uh, that's what the satellite looked like um, in the end about 1.7 kgs of mass. Um, and we deployed using an ISRO uh, launch and a deployer um, and uh, yeah. This was the payload that we built. We took a commercial off the shelf board with these um, infrared and ultraviolet sensors and we built a payload board that was actually looking out and, uh, and, and seeing the sun um, in, in 18 different channels. Uh, we used a few subsystems that we bought from third party vendors. Um, it was not a great idea. I like to build my own, but you know, the first satellite, we really wanted to put it together, have the students, give the students the experience of putting it together and testing it rather than building everything from scratch. Uh, but for Scoop 2, we actually built um, built, built everyone, built every subsystem. So Scooby um, or Scoop 1 is a pun uh, because at Scoop comes from S cube, which stands for Student Satellite Series. So S cube became Scoob, S cube 1 became Scooby, and then of course S cube 2 became Scooby Doo. So. We have Scooby and Scooby Doo, um, the two satellites. We built our solar panel. So uh, this was my PhD student, and he was testing out the solar panels. Um, uh, and yeah, I mean, we make it out of PCBs. We assemble with the solar cells, and we do what we call a glow test, where a solar cell, if you pass current through it, acts like an LED. So if you pass a voltage that is high enough, then its own voltage, then it will run the current through it and you can glow it like an LED and you can test for any deformities or irregularities or look connectivity between the cells. So that the red thing that you see is a solar panel that's glowing when a current is passed through it. Um, we also did what we call the pointing system test. So uh, to do that, what we do is we build out the board and then we put the system on a on what we call an air bearing table. So it's compressed there, pushing up uh, the system. And then we have something like a sun simulator, which is a bright lamp. And then um, and then the system can actually try and um, and 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 point to it. So if you want to look at the sun or you want to point your solar panels at the sun, we can simulate that and have the system point at it, which is what the students are doing here uh, for testing testing our pointing system. Uh, some pictures of the assembly and the student team that actually built it. Um, 
just before launch. This is at Sriharikota. So we are testing out the satellite just before we put it in the deployer. Um, and we engrave all the students' names are on another plate. So we engrave everybody's names on the on the satellite as well. So you know your names been to been to space. Um, and and it launched off of uh, PSLV as well. And we received uh, beacons in the first pass about uh, one hour later over Singapore. Um, so that was really nice because we knew the satellite was operational and working fine. Uh, this was some of the, the data we get. This is from the solar spectral sensor where we are getting the different counts from the uh, from the sensors. And we could see how it was rotating. So two axes, as I said, it points uh, north, south, and then the third axis slowly rotates. Um, so you get about eight degrees rotation in the third axis. Uh, and we could get, um, you know, different data from each of these packets. And you can see how, what the temperatures are on different sides of the spacecraft as well. So, um, yeah, the mission lasted six months and we achieved all our objectives of student and staff training in spacecraft development, testing and operations. Uh, we validated a number of systems. Uh, we could not take a picture or download a picture because the data was too big. We we knew it was a little bit difficult to be able to operate the camera, so we were not very unhappy about it. But um, it was it was um, you know we knew that we would not get that. Uh, Scooby Doo is going up in two days' time along with uh, InspireSat four, the largest a spacecraft that you saw being put together. But this one, unlike the other one, has deployable panels, and that's what the inside of it looks like. So this is the attitude control system. So it's not a permanent magnet anymore, uh, and we actually built all the boards inside it. So this is how tightly packed the inside of the satellite. It's still not big. It's only this big. Um, so. That's what it looks like with the uh, panels closed. Um, uh, and we have a customer payload that uh, is actually from the Singapore defense. So we are building out, they're testing out some chips that would be part of a future radar satellite that they are building, but they want to qualify those chips on orbit. So we're using the CubeSat for that. So that's again, another thing that CubeSats are really good for, for qualifying other hardware. Um, that was the design. And this is how actually everything got put together. So you can see how the design process and the actual realization works together, which is um, which is quite similar. Uh, yeah, one of the things that changed was that we we like the white and black panels better than the green and uh, black. So we changed the panel color uh, to white. I just think it looks a lot cooler um, with the with the black panels. Um, so again, how were we doing this? I taught two undergrad, I taught two courses at NTU. So I had a course in introduction to spacecraft design. So the students would come in and get an understanding of all the different aspects that goes into building a satellite. And then I had a graduate course that I taught as well. Um, and then we took in PhD students, postgraduate students, undergraduate final year students, third year students, and then interns and volunteers that wanted to be part of satellite program. So Every year we would get about 15 to 20 students. So this was really hit during COVID times, unfortunately, but you know, we still uh, had to, um, you know, we, I mean, we had to go out and get students. Um, so we put all of these flyers. So we would have, you know, this was actually a flyer that we put in um, arts, uh, arts and sciences, because we wanted students to come in and help us with uh, promotion. Um, and and um, you know artwork of how the satellite data would be used. Um, so this one was for um, uh, mechanical engineering. So we had the rocket. Uh, this one was also mechanical engineering, and then we put it. You know we tried to tailor it to the student that we were trying to attract. So we would put these flyers all over campus, and then uh, we would get a few students to come and join it. We actually had to go and ask students to join because Singapore become, being a financial center, everybody wants to go into finance. Um, and yeah, some of the students that worked on it, um, it was it's always a fun group. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about, and I'm sure somebody will ask this question, is that we are putting all of these stuff into space. What's happening with debris, right? Uh, it's a question I always get, so I'm just preempting that question and just telling you what's going on. It is a very serious problem, and if you look at all of the objects um, that are in, um, you know, in space now, uh, it's going up exponentially. So you can see the tracked objects are just going up. And this bump in, in over here 
uh, at the end is caused by the small satellites that we are putting in right now. Uh, and these really big um, ones are where, you know, this one was a Chinese weapon test in uh, 2005 or six, which really increased the, uh, the debris. And then there was a collision between a defunct, uh, a, or, you know, something called Cosmos, which was a debris from a, a rocket, and then an iridium satellite that again increased the debris. Um, and then and then all of this, this increase is from the increased number of um, active satellites, this, this part that's going away. Um, so that is an active problem. If you look at space, you know, Earth has a radius of 6,378. You add another 500 kilometers or a thousand kilometers, you're looking at a sphere of that volume and that surface area, and all of these objects are in there. So you have about 25,000 tracked objects. So 25,000 objects of varying sizes in a sphere of radius 7,000 kilometers. So it's a lot of space. So the chances of a collision are very small, but however, you know, there's a lot of small satellites going up. Small satellites are not really the problem because if you look at perigee, which is the highest point altitude, a lot of them are below 600 kilometers uh, or 500. So things below 500 kilometers will deorbit or come back and burn up within about three to four years. Uh, so all of these satellites are actually gonna deorbit uh, within about three years time. Uh, so this is the part that you know we are we're worried about. So as you see, most of the academic satellites are all you know below the 500 kilometers. So I think the industry has been self-regulating to quite a bit. Um, commercial industry not so much. They're putting it in places where it's going to be difficult to get it back, especially things like one web, which is 900 kilometers. It's never going to come back. I mean, it's going to be like hundreds of years before it re-enters. Um, uh, I am the uh, I am the lead in charge of InspireSat One, and this is just an example of some of the notifications I get from the Space Squadron 18th Force, which sends these notifications out. And you will notice that um, uh, the what the this is between a close approach between InspireSat One and another space object. And if you look here, the radial miss distance is 1.5 meters. This is really close. Uh, and here it's 1.2 meters, and probability of collision is 0.3%. 0.3% is high because that means three out of 1,000 times it will collide. So there's three out of 1,000 chance that it will collide, which is a very high chance of collision for two objects to be close. Uh, but we didn't have propulsion, so we couldn't change it. Um, and I get these close approach notification for all of the satellites that I'm involved in. I get about five, six mails a day. Um, for for the satellites that I have, uh, so it is a real problem, um, and uh, yeah, and and I think we need to have legislation and some kind of regulatory process to control it in the future. So, um, I think with that, I'm going to end my lecture and open the floor up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ramal, for giving such an inspiring and exciting talk that shed light on where the space science or the space industry or rather the satellite industry is heading. And I'm sure all the participants got a picture on how universities worldwide and space agencies in particular are faring when it comes to launching satellites. I presume it's right time our universities also and the colleges also jammed on this bandwagon. Now it's time for a small interaction with the speaker. I welcome the audience to ask your doubts, questions, whatever. Uh, you can unmute yourself before you shoot your questions. We have over 70 participants now. Please, you can unmute yourself and shoot your questions. Hello? 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 Hello, sir? Yeah. Hello, sir? Yeah, I can yes, hear sir, you. Yes, sir. Uh, this is uh, Principal uh, in CRC uh, uh, Vatapalam. I am I am very uh, uh, thankful to you, sir, for uh, highlighting uh, uh, such a wonderful uh, session for the students, which is uh, actually a need of the hour for the students. Uh, students are uh, I am sure students are motivated for uh, uh, developing uh, even the uh, small uh, uh, educational websites. Uh, I mean uh, educational satellites for the colleges. I am sure that uh, your presentation has uh, helped all our students. 
and uh, we are uh, at it and we are planning to have give more training for the students uh, uh, using all uh, the applications uh, the project thank you so much uh, thanks for uh, hello Th uh, uh, yes. thanks for kt for organizing such a wonderful uh, series thank you sir i am uh, dr k karibasappa i am actually uh, working as a principal in ncrc what up all thank, thank, thank you sir. very thank much you. for your kind words sir thank you very much for your kind words i hope that you know uh, that th this this and, gives and, an idea of how things are built and and it can inspire a few people and, thank you and very, very very nicely it is shown practical model how actually it is assembled and all those things uh, that is uh, actually it is uh, very good motivation for the students for doing uh, uh, practical uh, uh, the it is my understanding that the more uh, skill uh, enhancement and our development uh, techniques are uh, presented today thank you so much sir thank you very much thank you if there are no more questions can i ask you one doubt sure please please, sir. please treat this doubt as something that comes from a public um, you know uh, the general public because i don't have any basic um, idea about how these things work so basically these oceans and space offers a lot of opportunities for tourism and we know the risk involved in in such unpredictable and sometimes beyond our control spaces like ocean and space and with the recent incident like the implosion of titan submersible however my question is uh, what's the future of space tourism in your thoughts i think it is an emerging field so if you look at like what has happened um, uh, you know with the implosion right um, one of the things that actually comes to mind when you look at that is that um, the process of testing was not rigorously followed. There were known problems with the design flow and, you know, carbon composite structure that were used. Um, so it was uh, a company that you're operating in international waters and space is very similar that way that, you know, you are operating in international waters again with regards to space because there is no territorial jurisdiction of any one country um, in, in, in space. Uh, so there are going to be uh, areas where companies can actually not test systems properly um, where, you know, you can have accidents like that happen. Um, the space tourism has actually already started. Um, there was, you know, in 20, 25 years ago, when the Mir space station was operational, the Russians flew some millionaires onto the Mir space station. Uh, a couple of tourists have gone to the International Space Station. Uh, a couple of them have actually flown on um, the, uh, the uh, what is it, the Blue Origin rocket that Jeff Bezos has. Um, you know, Bezos flew on on it. It was it it didn't really orbit the Earth, but it went up on a suborbital flight and landed back. Uh, his brother flew, so that there, there's been a few Blue Origin flights that have taken people up. Um, Virgin at Virgin Galactic is another company that is offering uh, space rides. So again, this is not orbital; it's a suborbital. Uh, so the but there are people signing up. I think our own Santosh George Kolangara has signed up for a, for a flight also, and he probably will go up soon as well. So that is an emerging field, and and as these orbital vehicles mature, you're going to get orbital flights. You know, not just suborbital. You're going to have private space stations being built within the next. 15 years. There's already companies that are moving forward to build private space stations. Uh, so private space stations will obviously need tourists to be able to, to run the business. Um, so it's going to it's it's going to happen within the next 15 years. Uh, and it's going to grow. There is going to be, you know, we are not going to be a civilization confined to the earth. We are going to have stations on the moon. Um, the U.S. Has already has the Artemis program where there is going to be a permanent presence on the moon. There's going to be a, a station called Lunar Gateway that will orbit uh, the moon. So it's a space station that will be orbiting the moon. And so there's going to be stations on the ground and it's not going to be far when, uh, you know, people actually go there for tourism. Uh, like any other field, it, this is an emerging field. Space is a little bit like the what we call the Wild West, where, you know, because it's international waters, a lot of companies have a lot of freedom on how they do things. Uh, but you have to make sure that um, due process and regulations are in place so that, you know, accidents can be minimized or, or prevented. 
Thank you so much. Any more questions? Hello, can I? Can I? Can, can I? Yes, ma'am, please. Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Jamuna, member of the syndicate of APJ. Uh, Dr. Amal, uh, it was a really of inspiring uh, presentation. I have a fear regarding the satellite uh, launch and uh, it uh, transforming into an industry. That's the fear. Had it not become an industry, uh, the fear wouldn't have been there. Uh, as a question to uh, uh, the question of uh, space tourism, don't you think that there will be in future a kind of uh, colonization of space? And what kind of imperialism will uh, evolve out of it? Uh, that is the fear that I see. And also the fear that you address the debris. That is also a fear that I foresee. What is your and take on it? I think it's a very um, it's a very valid fear. Um, unfortunately, the industrialization of space has already happened. Uh, so you know when you, the, the 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 plot that I showed where you see the commercial operators. So right now the largest constellation and satellite operators are not government anymore. Uh, within the last three years, it's drastically changed. It is commercial operators that are operating the largest satellite constellations uh, that are up right now. Um, so the industrializations unfortunately happened. But what we need as a community to do is to make sure that there are regulations in place that can make this sustainable that we don't repeat the mistakes we've made in the past where you know imperialization imperialism and first movers are nations with the 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 technological advantage to actually put or like you know send satellites up send uh, space stations up send um, a colonized uh, moon or mars or mine resources do it in a um, non sustainable way uh, we are already seeing these problems. Space debris was nobody's problem before. So nobody did anything to address it. Um, and each country, uh, each launching country has separate regulations on what they deem as acceptable. So let's say that I put a satellite up in um, 2000 kilometers where my design life for my satellite is one year. Okay. It is very irresponsible of me to be putting it into a 2000 kilometer orbit because that means that satellite's going to be up there for centuries. Okay. It's going to be up there for millennia at 2000 kilometers. Um, so, why would I want to put my satellite with a design life of one year into an orbit? So, the launching state should make sure that if your design life is at this, this much, you should be able to deorbit of your satellite within a reasonable period of time. These regulations need to be in place so that you know this debris problem can be addressed. Um, so it, it again takes regulations. It needs somebody to say, look, uh, it needs people to not be money motivated because again, you can bring satellites down. But what happens is that you have to carry that extra fuel so the cost of launching a satellite is in getting weight into space. So carrying fuel to deorbit your satellite means it's more expensive. So there needs to be regulations in place where people need to do that. So keeping things sustainable is very important. Already addressing the, the debris problem is very important. And um, there are questions like astronomy. If you put too many satellites up in orbit, what happens to the night sky? Is our kids generation the last one that will be able to see a night sky from the earth? Because if you have satellites everywhere, you're going to see reflections, you're going to just see orbiting satellites. Um, so there's a lot of questions here that needs to be addressed. But unfortunately, the, the answer to that is not to stop because, you know, it's, I mean, it's, we are beyond that state, right? Because let's say connectivity, for example, nobody is going to take cellular communications out. Nobody is going to say that we can't have GPS. So once people, humans are dependent on these satellite systems, then, and there is real money in that, um, in that market, then uh, we can't stop it, but we need to make sure that 
uh, we act responsibly and keep it sustainable for future generations. No, uh, the thing is that like we have been now very uh, seriously thinking about having a sustainable earth. So likewise, we should uh, we should start thinking about a sustainable space for which yes. I think international laws should be generated. Uh, Absolutely. And it should come from uh, uh, people like you, from your end. So, you know, I mean, my position to this has always been that we need to be, uh, if regulations are not in place, uh, especially universities, we need to be self-regulating. So I have tried to make sure, I always say this in panels that I've been invited to be on that, um, that, you know, as a community, we should be self-regulating in these cases. Um, so I absolutely agree with you that it's, uh, it's, it's on the space community to make sure that these uh, regulations are in place so that we do it in this uh, sustainable manner as we um, as we continue to grow, as the industry continues to grow. So I always make this uh, example, like, you know, my grandmother is 97 years old um, and it was in her lifetime that the first transatlantic flights happened. So in the last hundred years, we can see how much the aviation industry has happened, has grown, right? Um, we are going to see similar kind of growth in the space industry over the next 50 to 100 years. Um, so you are absolutely right that this is the right time to uh, to make sure that these regulations get, um, get put in. Uh, the UN is a really nice um, uh, entity for proposing these regulations. I am part of a task group from uh, an organization called COSPAR, Committee for Space Research, and they are also proposing uh, regulations that, um, that we hope the major space agencies will adopt. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you very much for that question. Yeah, there are two more questions coming out from uh, on the chat. Could you please see that? How much is the cost involved to build a small educational satellite? Um, this is a very interesting question. Uh, the cost depends on how complex your satellite needs to be. If you're building something like the Scoop 1 satellite, I have been able to build that from Singapore for um, under, I mean, under a hundred thousand dollars. So I think in terms of, um, I think we can, you can probably build it for about 50, $50,000, which is 40 lakhs, I think 40, 40, 45 lakhs probably. Um, but the scope would be, I mean, you would have to limit it to, um, uh, I, I think, you know, I mean, I'm built, my company is in uh, India now. And I can see that the cost of manufacturing in India is much more cost effective than in the US or Singapore. So my assumption would be you can build a satellite for about 30 to 40 lakhs and then launch would cost you another, uh, probably another $40,000. So another 30 to 40 lakhs again. So I think you would need one crore to build the satellite and launch it. But if ISRO um, launches an educational satellite, ISRO has a program where they launch educational satellites, so then you might be able to get a contributed launch. Thank you. There is one more. Uh, one the more. question is on how can students who completed graduation in engineering join your team at University of Colorado? Um, so you need to apply. So if you're pursuing... Um, a uh, master's or a PhD, you need to write a GR, you need to write the GRE and then apply for the master's program um, to the aerospace engineering department at, um, at CU Boulder. And then there are opportunities to join the satellite team. Um, so yeah, and I think there are, it's similar. You can also apply for master's program in um, EE at NTU if you would like to join the NTU team as well. I think, uh, uh, what what yeah. is the scope of artificial intelligence in the space industry? Uh, very good question. Uh, you know, I mean, I was looking, I mean, chat GPT uh, can actually do a system design of a satellite really fast. So I was, uh, I was playing around with it and it gives you very valid answers. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty good first approximation that you can get from, um, from AI. Um, then there is actually AI being used for image processing. For example, let's say that you have an imager um, and, and so images tend to generate a lot of data and you have to pay for your downlink time 
And it, it, so if you downlink every single image, and sometimes let's say that you know, you're know you imaging uh, Kerala, you know how cloudy it can get over Kerala. Uh, most of the images will be of clouds. So there are edge computing and uh, AI uh, systems that will detect the clouds and automatically screen the images for the good one. So uh, there are many different applications. So you can use it for um, you know computing and then um, the onboard processing of the data. Uh, you can use it for uh, anomaly detection and uh, target pointing. So there's quite a number of things that AI is being used for in many different aspects of the uh, of, of the satellite industry, just like any other industry. Uh, steps done for recycling satellites and ally components? No. Uh, so there is a treasure trove of um, stuff up in space but it's really hard to go and get it, uh, the things that are in orbit. The things that are lower in orbit actually will uh, low get, the, their orbits will decrease because of drag. Uh, so let's say you are under 600 kilometers, the drag will cause you to deorbit and burn up in the atmosphere. Um, uh, but yeah, there is a lot of, you know, spend upper stages of rockets, uh, dead satellites up in space that, that you can't, that you, that is very difficult to use. Just, just floating it there. Thank you, thank you all for your kind words. Thank you all for asking your questions. I think it's time that we conclude the session. Thank you for, thank you all for your this wonderful event. This would have been a very dull experience without each one of you. Mm, but uh, you have made it uh, very remarkable, very memorable. Now I invite Dr. Shalich, Dean Research of the University, to formally propose the word of thanks. Thank you. Uh, good morning. On behalf of APJ Abdul Kalam Technological University, it is with immense gratitude that I express our thanks to all of you for being part of this online talk to commemorate Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam on his death anniversary. First and foremost, we extend our sincere appreciation to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Amal Chandran, who has graced this event with his invaluable insights and wisdom into space science. You have taken us through various stages of design of design as well as fabrication of small satellites with pictures and demonstrations, which I'm sure have left a lasting impression on all those who are present here. So uh, I also express my thanks to our Honorable Vice Chancellor who have ensured the event was organized very well. To all the attendees, including our faculty and students, thank you for being an enthusiastic and an engaging audience. And last but not least, our, my heartfelt thanks to go to all our staff who have joined online. Once again, thank you all for gracing us with your presence and making this event a memorable one. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you, sir. With everyone's consent, I announce that the event has concluded. Wishing you all a very good day ahead. And for Dr. Amal, a good night. The Thank you very much. Thank the you. funny side of time zones. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah.